Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Okay, so we've now had a little bit of a study of uh, the machinery in the outer membrane of the mitochondria, namely these BCL2 proteins, which are capable of causing the release of cytochrome C from the intermembrane space, and I've told you that that's going to then lead on to apoptosis. Okay, so now what we want to do is get the bigger picture. We want to get the whole pathway down in one, basically. And we're going to look at the pathway for DNA damage and how if the DNA isn't repaired, uh, i.e. DNA repair mechanisms fail, then P53 will drive the cell into apoptosis. And basically, we want to look at how it interacts with this machinery, basically. Okay, so let's start off with some DNA damage then. So let's say this is our... DNA here, whoops, uh, DNA here, and uh, let's say we have um, some x-rays coming in, which are going to damage the DNA. So in comes an x-ray here, okay, and it's going to cause a double strand break in the DNA. So it's going to cause both of the strands basically to break, let's say down here. Okay, so let's draw that happening now. So the DNA has broken into two halves, like so. So here's the first half, and now here is the second half, which is split off from the first half. Okay, so we've got this double-strand break in the DNA. So this is a double-strand break. Okay, so we want to look at how this DNA uh, double-strand break is going to be detected and then uh, what the response to it is going to be. So, uh, I just want to stress that this is a specific example of uh, DNA damage, but there are lots of other ways that DNA can be damaged. For instance, you can get single strand breaks, uh, where just a single one of the strands is broken and the other one remains intact. Uh, you can get uh, chemical alterations to the DNA, great big chemicals sticking on the side of them, and in fact that's a way that many of the, um, the anti-cancer chemotherapies, which we'll study later, work. They add huge, great chemical groups onto the side of the DNA, and then that leads to um, the cell committing suicide, basically, uh, because it just can't repair it. Okay? Um, but we're looking specifically at this double-strand break, just because it's a nice, simple example of um, how the DNA can be damaged. Okay, right. So how is this DNA damaged uh, damage sensed within the cell, basically. Well, there are two proteins which are capable of sensing DNA damage. Well, there are probably far more, but there are two proteins which I know of. Uh, the two archetypal proteins which sense DNA damage are um, have fantastic names, truly fantastic names. Uh, one is called ATM, okay? And this stands for Ataxia Telangiectasia mutated. So it's a protein that's mutated in ataxia telangiectasia, which is quite a um, rare disease, it would be fair to say. Okay, so ataxia telangiectasia mutated, and some people pronounce that telangiectasia. So uh, if you, um, some people, I, I prefer to leave the I uh, silent, but some people will pronounce it telangiectasia. Um, so ataxia telangiectasia mutated. Okay, uh, and the other one is called ATR, and again, this is named after ataxia telangiectasia. So it's ataxia telangiectasia, telangiectasia, uh, and rad free related peptide. So this is and rad free related. Oh, sorry, not related peptide, related protein. Okay, so this is ataxia telangiectated related protein. Okay, right. Um, so, uh, what do these two proteins do? Well, basically, when the DNA is damaged, they become activated. So they sense the DNA damage, and they become activated. And what they are, both of these uh, proteins, are examples of serine threonine kinases. So they're both serine threonine kinases. And basically that means that they're going to add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. 
So let me just give you a reminder of uh, the structure of a serine and a threonine residue and then how you can add phosphate groups onto it and then what that means for the protein. Okay, so if we re revise our basic amino acid structure, here's the amino group up here. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxylic acid group down here. And off the alpha carbon, we also have a hydrogen. And then in the case of serine, the R group of the amino acid is a methylene group with a hydroxyl group then off the end here. So that's the structure of the amino acid serine. Now, in the case of threonine, let's draw out the amino acid structure again. So here's the amino terminus, uh, or the amino group. Uh, then you have the alpha carbon here, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and the carboxyl group down here off the alpha carbon. Okay, right. Now, the R group in the case of threonine, again, you have a carbon with a hydroxyl group coming off it there, and the hydrogen here, so it's identical so far, but then off this carbon, you have a methyl group. So that's the structure of the amino acid threonine. So both of them have a very similar R group structure. Okay, and both of them basically can have phosphate groups, which I'll draw here. So the structure of a phosphate group is that you have a phosphorus atom at the center, then you have an oxygen double bonded to it here, and then two hydroxyl groups coming off the phosphorus atom as well, and also a single bond with another oxygen atom, uh, which has uh, a negative charge because it has gained an electron from some other source uh, in an ionic um, bond fashion. Okay, um, so if you're going to bind a phosphate group onto these hydroxyl groups, and again, you can imagine it's completely analogous for threonine, what you do is you remove the hydroxyl group from this phosphate group here. You remove the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group of the serine. Those two come off and form a water molecule. Okay, so here's our water molecule. And then you form a new bond between the oxygen and the phosphorus atom of the phosphate group, okay? And this sort of a reaction, because it emits, well, because it gives off water, because you produce water, is known as a condensation reaction. So this is a condensation reaction. Okay, right. So um, that's how you phosphorylate serine and threonine residues, basically. You add this phosphate group in this condensation reaction way. Right, so... Uh, when these two proteins, ataxia telangiectasia mutated and ataxia telangiectasia and RAD3 related protein, become active upon sensing DNA damage, they are going to gain uh, their serine threonine kinase activity. So they're now going to become active serine threonine kinases. So I'll draw them like this with a nice big active site there. Okay? And they're going to go and add phosphate groups onto uh, the serine and threonine residues of other proteins, okay? And in particular, what they're going to do is they're going to add phosphate groups onto two more serine threonine kinases. So let me show this down here. So I'll denote this as ATM slash ATR because their function is effectively the same. Uh, so by ATM slash ATR, I do not mean some chimera of ATM and ATR, I mean ATM or ATR. Okay, so basically what it's going to do, uh, whichever one it is, is it's going to add phosphate groups onto proteins, and specifically there are two proteins known as the checkpoint kinase 1, checkpoint kinase 1, often abbreviated to CHK1, so CHK1, Okay, is this still visible? Yeah. And secondly, the checkpoint kinase 2 here, which is often abbreviated to CHK2. So CHK2 is the abbreviation for that. Now, these two enzymes, again, they are serine threonine kinases. And before they have the phosphate group added onto them by the activated ATM slash ATR serine threonine kinase, they are inactive. So upon receiving this phosphorylation by the ATM or the ATR, they become active, basically. So here is our ATM and uh, sorry, here is our checkpoint one slash checkpoint uh, sorry checkpoint kinase one slash checkpoint kinase two enzyme now with a phosphate group stuck on the end of it, and it's now active. 
OK, so again, their function is effectively the same. So I will denote this enzyme as CHK1 slash CHK2 to denote that it's either um, checkpoint kinase 1 or checkpoint kinase 2, but don't be forward into thinking it's some sort of chimera of both of them. OK, right, and what's going to happen is that the checkpoint kinase 1 enzyme and the check or slash the checkpoint kinase 2 enzyme is going to activate the P53 protein. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.